All right, so the question is going around right now that I'm getting and probably some of you are asking is, should I buy a house in 2023? And I'm going to discuss whether it actually is a good time for you to purchase a house in 2023. And the answers might surprise you. So you want to stick around for that. Now, the inflation numbers just came out this past week, April 12th to be exact. And it showed that inflation month over month only increased 0.1%. Now the forecast was 0.2%. So we came in under forecast, which is a good thing. We're currently sitting at 5% in March versus 6% in February. So obviously inflation is cooling. And part of that, which was leading up to that decrease was a decrease in energy costs. Those were down by like 3.5%. At any rate, that's headline inflation. What the Fed looks at is something called core inflation and core inflation was up 0.4% versus the previous month. In fact, it's currently sitting at 5.6%. So core inflation strips out volatile pricing for things like energy and food. So now you see why that price is back up. And that's the thing that the Fed is looking at. Why? Because you still got to pay for that stuff and it's going to be a direct reflection on your income. So the Fed actually looks at that versus the headline CPI numbers for inflation. So we're talking 5% versus close to 6% with the Fed's target rate for inflation being closer to 2%. So obviously we have a long way to go. Now with this latest data that just came out with inflation being at 5.6% and actually taking an uptick, you can probably gamble and say that the Fed is going to raise rates one more time when they meet next in May, May 3rd to be exact. In fact, the markets are actually pricing in that 69% probability that the Fed is going to raise interest rates another 25 basis points when they next meet. Now, while the Fed is pushing rates higher, I would appreciate if you'd actually push that like button. It just lets YouTube know that you are enjoying the channel and hopefully it pushes it out to people such as yourself who find value in this content. So please hit that like button right now. And if you want to leave a comment, do so below. I'm pretty good at responding to that type of stuff. Now, one of the things that I found really interesting as I was digging deeper into the data was the shelter index. And it showed that the shelter index pricing was actually up 0.6%. Now that's the smallest gain that it's been since November. However, when you look at it overall, shelter prices were up 8.2%. And the Fed really looks closely at shelter, the shelter index because it makes up over a third of the waiting for the CPI. Now the CPI looks to capture price changes over a given time for goods and services that are consumed by a household. For housing, the Bureau of Labor Statistics is looking to measure the cost of consumption for the value of the home, not the actual change in value of the home itself. There are two primary tools that the BLS uses. One is called Owner's Equivalent of Rent Residences, or what they call OER, and the other one is Rent of Primary Residence, what I'm just gonna call rent. Now, if the housing unit is occupied by the owner, the BLS computes something called OER or owner's equivalent of rent. And essentially that's if an owner lives in a home, what would it cost for them to rent out the same place if that place was actually on the rental market? For tenant rent, the BLS looks at what the tenant pays the landlord in terms of rent. So it could be in the form of cash. So it could be cash or check, just however they work it. They say it's cash, but it's not necessarily like dollars that they're handing out directly. So it includes that and includes any utilities that are part of the lease and then any type of subsidies that are paid to the landlord on behalf of the tenant. So think things like Section 8. And back to what I was saying, the BLS doesn't really look at home values to compute this, right? So when somebody is purchasing a home or doing a renovation or a home improvement project, the BLS doesn't take those numbers into consideration for this index because they treat that more of as an investment rather than consumption. And that's really what this index is looking at. It's the consumption that, that households have on goods and services and the price changes between those things. Now, another thing that the Fed is watching closely is employment data. And those numbers came out last week as well, which shows that in March, the market added 236,000 jobs. That seems like a lot, but if you compare that to the 334,000 that were added on average over the past six months, we can see that while employment is actually kind of 
there are more jobs that are coming into the market still, the pace at which they're coming in is much, much slower. And that really aligns with our unemployment data. So right now, our unemployment rate sits at three and a half percent versus 3.6 percent in the previous month. It's not a huge dip in terms of unemployment, but you can see where those numbers coincide. Now, if we look at all of this stuff holistically, it's no wonder that consumer confidence for housing is really toward the lower end of the spectrum. And Fannie Mae produces something called the Home Purchase Sentiment Index. And in that, they ask people whether they believe that now was a good time to buy and also a good time to sell. Amazingly, 79% of the people that were surveyed said that right now is a bad time to purchase a home. Compare that to those when they ask if it's a good time to sell a home, 40% said it's a bad time to sell a home. And these numbers aren't a real shock. Consumer confidence and sentiment toward housing has been on the decline month over month, at least since like May of 2021. And go figure, buyers are facing higher interest rates, high home prices, and they don't really know what's gonna happen with this whole inflation thing. And the case Shiller Index really kind of talks to some of this struggle. Now the case Shiller index really, that's what measure home, measures home prices, but it's a two month lagging indicator. And I'll explain what that means a little bit later. So the case Shiller index showed that month over month, home prices actually fell minus 0.55%. And you would say, yeah, that's right. Housing prices are tending to fall. However, when you look at it year over year, that index is actually up 3.8%, which suggests that home prices are still actually elevated. Now, why is this important to know month over month versus the entire year, like a 12 month rolling period? I told you that it's a lagging indicator. So this report came out in March, which means that these numbers correlate to what happened in December and January. And if you've been watching my channel for any time, I've told you that real estate is cyclical. So when we get to Q4, even into Q1, Sales typically slow down anyway. Why? People are gearing up for the holidays, so we don't see a lot of sales in October, November, or December. And then it starts to actually take a ramp up closer toward February. What's really going to be a telling sign is the spring number. Spring is the time where we usually see a huge influx of buyers and sellers come into the market. It's one of the busiest times that we have in real estate. But those numbers aren't going to come out until like June. So <laughs> it's going to be interesting to see how they kind of adjust for all of that based off of this information. So that's kind of a no brainer to see that, you know, from the previous month to the next month, prices were down. Again, a lagging indicator. This is a little bit old data. Now they adjust it based on that, but still it's cyclical. So you kind of understand why those numbers would trend downward. What we also saw is that the Mortgage Bankers Association showed that mortgage applications versus last week were up 5.3%. And you would probably think like, okay, how is that happening? If prices are high and interest rates are high, why are people going out to get mortgages? Well, what happened was based off of the last jobs information that we received, the mortgage rates started to take a little bit of a cool off. So people started rushing in to kind of lock in those lower mortgages and take advantage of it. Well, when the CPI data came out, it wiped out some of those gains that we saw in negative pressure on mortgage rates. So based on this information, I think that what's going to wind up happening as we're led up into the release of the PCE numbers, which is another index that the Fed looks at to measure inflation, the PCE numbers, which are released on April 28th, and then the Fed's next meeting, which is scheduled for May 3rd, literally like the week after the PCE numbers come out, I think we're going to see an upward tick in mortgage rates leading up into that. In fact, Craig Lazar, who's the managing director at S&P DJI states, and just for the record, he's at the company that actually produces the Case Shiller Index. But he said that mortgage financing and the prospect of economic weakness are therefore likely to remain a headwind for housing prices for at least the next several months. Now, as I dug a little bit more deeper into the Fannie Mae HPSI report, there was something called the Home Price and Mortgage Rate Expectation Survey. And in that, they asked people what they thought were going to happen to mortgage rates over the next 12 months. A whopping 51% of those who responded to the survey said that they expect mortgage rates to increase 
over the next 12 months. And this can be expected because if you look at the finance and banking industries overall, we saw that there are some bank failures and there are some liquidity issues. And the Fed is looking at all this. It's no wonder that some of the staff members on the Fed believe that we're heading into a mild recession closer toward the end of this year. And it'll probably stay that way for the next couple of years. Now we get back to the question that I asked earlier in the video, should you buy a home in 2023? And the answer is really gonna depend on a number of factors. Number one, do you have stable employment? If your job is in jeopardy or there have been talks of layoffs, this is probably not the best time to make a major financial commitment to a mortgage because you don't know whether you're going to have the income to sustain it. And I would really hate to tell you to buy a house now, you lose a job and then you lose a house sometime later. That wouldn't be good. I don't want to see that happen to anybody. So if you know your job is in jeopardy, delay, hold, delay your purchase of a home until you know you're in a little bit more stable condition with your employment situation. Number two, do you have at least three to six months of living expenses? Now, if we are headed for a recession, there's one down the horizon. Employment is undoubtedly going to come into effect. There's going to be some people that get laid off. And it takes roughly three to six months in order for somebody to find a position. So during that time, you need money to basically supplement your living. Now, if you're going to get a nice severance package for your job, don't just blow it all. Include that in that three to six months. You might want to put it in there because it could extend you out for another nine, maybe 12 months because none of us know how this is going to work. The Fed's whole thing in curbing inflation to raise interest rates is to really put pressure on borrowing costs. But when those costs spill over from the consumer to businesses, one of the biggest things that a business has to pay is overhead in terms of salaries. So if they can't justify salaries versus what they're making in revenue, they're going to be some people that lose their jobs. And that was part of one of the things that Jerome Powell got drilled on from Senator Warren about what would you say to all these people who are going to lose their jobs based on what it is that you're trying to do? And essentially, he said, in a nutshell, hey, a few out of the many will we'll take that risk. That's kind of jacked up, but at least you know what's coming. Number three, will buying a house significantly increase your living expenses on a month to month basis? Now, there's a rule of thumb that states that only 26% of your gross income should be used toward housing. But you don't live off of your gross income. You live off the net. So I'm going to bump that number up and say that at least no more than 35% of your take home pay should be used to cover your mortgage. Number four, are your credit cards over their 30% utilization rate? If you don't know what that means, I did a video on the FICO scoring system. You can catch that up there. But essentially what it is, is you take your outstanding balance on what you owe with your credit cards, divide that by your credit limit. It's gonna give you a percentage. If that percentage is 30% or way higher, this may not be the best time for you to purchase a house. Why is that? Because your credit card interest rate is really correlated to the Fed funds rate that the Fed <laughs> has been jacking up, which means even on the same balance, you're probably going to be paying more in on your credit cards than you would have in previous months. That's going to kill the amount that you can actually save, right? So if your credit utilization rate is well above 30%, I would suggest you either pay those off or pay as, pay as much as you can down so that you can continue saving. If you can't, this is probably not a good time to purchase a house. So whether it's a good time to buy or sell a home really boils down to personal and financial decisions. If there is an incoming recession over the horizon, there's some things that you should do to kind of hedge yourself and your family in to protect what you have or just to stay afloat. I discussed those things in this video right here, so you definitely wanna watch this one next.